Let me contact my ship again. They have no idea they're flying into a battle zone. Please, Philippa. I'm not Philippa to you. But you are right about one thing. He preyed on my sentiment, my weakness for your face. It will not happen again. Take her to the brig. Welcome to our review and analysis of Star Trek Discoveries Episode 13. What's past is prologue. Here is a spoiler warning for those of you who haven't seen this explosive episode just yet. Gabriel Lorca of 4275 Imperial Universe Boulevard frees his long-tortured team from the Imperial Agonizers. But does he have a plan? You think I'd come all this way without a plan? Lorca commandeers Imperial Stamets' bioweapon and uses it to start another coup. Emperor Giorgio decides to toss Prime Burnham into the brig, but not if Burnham has anything to say about it. It turns out that the Terran Empire treats the mycelial network the way we treat the magic juice of long-dead plants. How can a people be so short-sighted? There are high stakes for this multiverse adventure, as playing jazz with the Mushroom Highway will kill everyone and everything. And when it does, life as we know it will cease to exist. Lorca goes full on mirror, mega. I've watched for years. You and alien races spill over the borders, flourish in our backyard, and have the gall to incite rebellion. Uh oh. Hey, that looks familiar. An all out firefight in the bowels of the Imperial Palace results in many, many fatalities, including the Imperial version of Oshukun. Discovery's remaining crew develop a plan to destroy the ISS Charon and preserve the Great Mushroom Highway. Lorca takes the Imperial Throne. Oh look, a moon door. And Imperial Stamets is no more. It's poetic justice, don't you think? Science is destroyed by his own creation. Just kidding. I hate poetry. Lorca tries to convince Burnham to join his Imperial efforts. He is unsuccessful. Burnham successfully convinces Emperor Giorgio, however, to fight alongside her to defeat Lorca. Acting Captain Saru comes into his own. And make no mistake, Discovery is no longer Lorca's. She is ours. Yeah, that's right, Captain. Final confrontation with Gabriel Lorca. This is going to be awesome. Lorca says his final goodbyes to the crew of Discovery. You don't die today because she chose to stay by my side. I would like to hear that from her. You are not a reliable source. That's awkward. Everybody was See you around, Mr. Lorca. Um, didn't see that coming. Oh man, Landry, I am so sorry. You just can't stay alive in any universe. Discovery takes their one chance to get back to their native universe. Except they get the time off. We overshot by nine months. Oh, come on! It appears the Klingons have won the war. Oh, boy. Discovery has been hitting a confident stride these past few episodes. What's past is prologue is no different. This episode is a big deal for the second chapter of this show, tying up much of what the show's been building towards. Let's start with attempting to answer some small questions and then move on to larger implications. Do we really make it back to the Prime Universe by the end of the episode? Surely yes. Does the Prime Universe USS Defiant remain in the Terran Imperial Universe? Looks like that is also a yes. 
How angry is Emperor Giorgio going to be now that Michael Burnham not only saved her life, but whisked her away to another universe? I mean, I'd be upset. It depends on the universe, really. We won't go back. You don't know what it's like in our universe. The Federation's gone, the Borg is everywhere! Also, how will Giorgio react when she finds out that the guy in charge of Discovery is, essentially, what she might consider a snack? What was Lorca's hope for Michael Burnham? Was it love that kept her in his gaze? A misplaced affection for the Imperial Burnham? Or did Lorca have an eye on attacking the Prime Universe Federation at some point? We can't be sure now. But Lorca's sentimentality for Burnham was the key to his downfall. It is exactly the kind of weakness that any person in the Terran Imperial Universe would exploit if they could, including, ironically, Lorca. That brings us to Lorca's motivations in general. Clearly, his designs for another coup were long in the making, and patiently, painfully executed. In the end, Lorca clearly broadcast his worldviews on race, and society, and governance, in contrast to the United Federation of Planets. I know you understand that I had to lie to you, Michael, to get home. Just like you know that the Federation is a social experiment doomed to failure. Childish idealism, every species, Every choice, every opinion is not equal. No matter how much they want it to be, the strong and the capable will always rise. In this, Star Trek is firmly doubling down on thoughts about multiculturalism and the American Empire. Thoughts laid down way back with the original series and continuing through Discovery's incarnation of Klingon society. Additionally, the Terran Imperial Universe is a perfect space to explore today's upside-down politics, with its spotlights on brazen white supremacists and neo-Nazis, and its not-so-subtle but hopefully toothless inclinations toward fascism. The American emphasis on diversity as a strength has been questioned before, but the questioning hasn't been this strong for some time now. Naturally, Discovery's writing team would focus in on this. While Lorca's final revelation about his beliefs and intentions lines up perfectly with what we know about this bizarre parallel universe, it may have been more interesting to see a Lorca influenced by the Prime Universe Federation he spent so much time with. To have him come back to his native universe with these influences intact, this may have been a more satisfying installment to the conversation on multiculturalism Discovery is having with its audience too. Maybe we got just a hint of that in Jason Isaac's performance in this moment right here, as Lorca realizes he played the Federation all wrong. We would have helped you get home if you had asked. That's who Starfleet is. That's who I am. That's why I won't kill you now. So the Terran Empire is currently leaderless and still facing a rebellion by subjugated alien races. And if Lorca is to be believed, then Giorgio's reign as emperor weakened the resolve of the ideology of human supremacy upon which the empire is based. If that's true, then the Terran Empire is ripe for reform regarding how humanity and aliens interact with each other. Reforms that will later be carried out by this version of Mr. Spock. Time will tell. One thing is certain. Discovery has, hands down, produced the best outing to the Mirror Universe in probably the whole franchise. Perfectly balanced between cartoonish villainy and real-world cultural and political concerns, Discovery's first season will be a cornerstone for how we see the Terran Imperial Universe going forward. As long as we're praising the show, let's mention how strong the performances have been. Every actor on the show is clearly putting in 100%. Sonequa Martin-Green, Anthony Rapp, Jason Isaacs, Doug Jones, Mary Wiseman. But we feel that a special shout-out needs to be given to the larger cast whose faces and personalities we've gotten to know over the first season. Discovery has used these actors in unexpected ways, with great payoff. Like when the Imperial version of Oshukun meets her unfortunate demise. This could have been any red shirt. But the moment really stands out because we've been getting to know this character subtly and slowly. Same with Imperial Captain Connor of the ISS Senjo, or Kayla Detmer. It is a real pleasure having a regular extended cast of this caliber. We hope that we get to see many of these faces again in Season 2. So what can we expect for the final episodes of Season 1? For starters, look for a conclusion to the Klingon War. How will this situation end? 
A clue might have something to do with the slight time travel involved in Discovery's return to the Prime Universe. Will Discovery travel back in time nine months or further to stop the war? I mean, there are no time cops yet. This seems to be outside the bounds of the temporal Cold War. So perhaps yes? Technically, Discovery doesn't belong nine months in the future, so they have to travel back in time now, right? And still, where is the ISS Discovery? Has it likely been creating chaos in the Prime Universe? Is that the reason why the Klingons have gained so much ground in the war? Probably. If so, then that means the USS Discovery will have to face down Captain Killy and the ISS Discovery. One more instance of mirroring as a theme for Discovery's first season. Fingers crossed, the conclusion is within reach. That's it for this review. Thank you for watching. If you like this and other Trek Expertise videos, then consider supporting the channel. Patreon is the best way for you to help create more Trek Expertise. However, you can also support the channel over at our Trek Expertise store. The choice is yours. You can find the relevant links in the subspace below. Only a couple more weeks now for these discovery reviews, and we'll be back to our regular video essay formats. We'll see you next week. Toy Show, Ryan. Think about it.